So I think we can start the proceedings and we are will be uh, yeah, just, just a minute we will be starting. So, uh, so can you start? Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Let's start. So, uh, so thanks, thanks everyone. And uh, the the today's session is going to be very much interesting for everybody. And uh, to begin the uh, so to begin the uh, talk, uh, let me first introduce all our esteemed uh, panelists and the speaker. So the thing is that uh, this uh, why we have chosen this topic because most of the time this is a uh, one of the important topic where. By the bedside uh, echocardiography and the by the uh, by the hands on the echocardiography, one can able to diagnose and uh, obviously detect lot of uh, clinical uh, troubleshooting. So that is the reason, and that's the reason I have requested Dr. Vivek Kumar. So Dr. Vivek Kumar is our esteemed speaker today, and he is basically the area of interest is echocardiography, and uh, probably I think uh, uh, that is why he is the best person to talk in this uh, forum. So uh, I welcome Dr. Vivek Kumar. Dr. Vivek Kumar is the Associate Director of HN Reliance Foundation Hospital. And uh, we are actually uh, working together a few years back. So we are fortunate to have him here. And with us, the other uh, uh, panelists are uh, like, uh, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Sarna Deepak from Hyderabad. He's working in the consultant intensivist from Hyderabad Apollo Hospital. And uh, with him, our other panelist, uh, Dr. Neeraj Tyagi. Dr. Neeraj Tyagi, sir, is from Gangaram Hospital. Uh, so we are happy to have him here. And we definitely would like to have some input from here also, him also. Uh, with us, uh, our other, my fellow colleague, Dr. Subhadeep, uh, but he's a little bit sicker today, so he's not able to join. And uh, with this, I hand over Dr. Akhiles to introduce Dr. Pradeep, sir who is also an eminent speaker and uh, one of the uh, active member of uh, different uh, this uh, such type of forum. So Achilles, please introduce. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gunadar. It was, it, it's indeed a great pleasure to conduct such programs, especially for the DNB st training students and IDCCM students. And we have all the stalwarts today. Dr. Vivek Kumar, he's the only certified uh, you know, uh, critical care physician with the 2D echocardiography diploma. So it will be worth uh, watching him and listening him today. And uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Vivek. I would al I I also welcome Dr. Pradeep Dikosta. Uh, he is also one of the pioneers in ultrasound and 2D eco. He is associated with the KM Hospital, and we will be able to uh, hear from him as well today. Uh, a lot of uh, fundamentals will be cleared up today. And we have other panelists uh, already dis uh, introduced by Dr. Gunadar. So without uh, uh, wasting time, uh, let me uh, inter uh, invite Dr. Vivek uh, to start the proceedings. So over to you, Dr. Vivek. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Akhilesh. Thank you, Gunadar. There was a time we worked together. And I think most of the loops are from those times. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, my talk here is basically aimed to improve your understanding of hemodynamics at the bedside by improving your understanding of the physiology of what is going on and the tool which you will be using to understand the physiology and improve your uh, clinical working will be echocardiography. Now, most of these terms, they do not come into any chapter as such. Okay, they are basically physiological connotations of ICU syndromes 
okay so it is a, this talk is based in a little i will say in a like a cross sectional study we will go through different facets of patient management so the talk outline is first we discuss what is the echocardiographic syndrome of acute cord pulmonal then we look into an echocardiography based understanding of ventricular interdependence and then we see the varying relationship between intraventricular pressures and volumes that it is not that every time the pressures are increased then the volumes are increasing or if the volumes are increasing the pressures are increasing and then of course in the last few slides i have summed it up to how to manage it at the bedside so we look at the first case and that is acute core pulmonal okay i mean this is a standard apical four chamber view in a patient who has come with a cardio respiratory compromise and primary facie if you look at this apical four chamber view i mean there is no doubt that the uh, right atrium and the right ventricle are dilated okay the other thing which we must see whenever we find that the ra and rv are dilated is that we look at the interventricular septum and we just try to see whether this septum is moving with the left ventricle or it's not moving with the right, uh, left ventricle but to keep it very simple you can find that the septum is not moving as fast as the free wall of the left ventricle now whenever you get such a picture in the intensive care unit you know the first diagnosis which comes because in mind is the syndrome of acute core pulmonal which basically means an acute pressure overload of the right ventricle that's it so somebody has put a break on the right ventricle output and therefore the ra and the rv which are very thin chambers they just distend okay this is as far as the first slide goes and this is the role of echo if you look at the x ray of this same patient i mean i don't think you can you can get any insight into what is happening with the patient nothing nothing meaningful we move on to another case this is a case which again came with a cardio respiratory compromise in fact this patient had just a resting sinus tachycardia and it was about 120 per minute he got admitted in the evening and we saw him next morning so in it this was a resting sinus tachycardia and if you look this is a parasternal long axis view but even for the beginners if you see this is the left atrium this is the left ventricle this is the iota this is the right ventricle this part of the right ventricle which appears in the parasternal long axis view is known as the right ventricular outflow tract but if you try even with a slight even if you are a beginner you should understand that the right ventricle never looks so big and prominent it's always the smaller baby to the left ventricle and the second thing is in the right ventricle you can see somebody waving a flag or raising a hand over here which is a hyperechoic it's a lobulated it's a, a mass which is generally attached to the interventricular septum okay so from this image i know that the right ventricle is dilated then when i look at the parasternal short axis view in the same patient okay and uh, please look at it very very closely i'll try to freeze the image and see if we can okay so this is the left ventricle this is the right ventricle this is the short axis view uh, below the mitral valve level and above the papillary muscle level and what you can see is that the left ventricle fluctuates between becoming an o and becoming a d so sometimes it's an o sometimes it's an d okay and now i'll try to freeze the image and show you so if you see this here the left ventricle is a d this is a d okay this is a d it is small and it's become a d and if i unfreeze it 
and now you see it's become an o okay and this is the right ventricle as it is now between the right ventricle and the left ventricle this is the interventricular septum so this is one of the views i think every intensivist should know how to produce and capture the most important thing of this view is to look at what is known as the flattening of the interventricular septum so if your icu patient is typically healthy you know the left ventricle will always be an o whether in systole or in diastole that means when you see the smallest size of the lv cavity that is the end systole it will be o when you see the largest size of the lv cavity that is end diastole it will be o but many a times you find that this lv is not an o it becomes a d and it can become a d in either systole or diastole okay so in this image we are seeing that the d basically comes in end systole when the lv is the smallest it becomes a d so my interpretation of the image is that there is a flattening of the interventricular septum in end systole okay and for those of you who are taking the boards to objectively quantify this uh, flattening for the purpose of exam nobody does it in real life is we use what is known as a eccentricity index whereby we take the two diameters one is a d1 that is from the interventricular septum to the free wall of the left ventricle and other is the d2 so d2 by d1 if it is equal to 0 that means lv is an o but if the interventricular septum slips into the lv cavity obviously d1 decreases and d2 by d1 becomes more than 1 so if d2 by d1 becomes more than 1 and it is seen in end systole it has a separate implication and if it is seen in diastole it has a separate implication which we will see in the successive slides this is the same patient and this is a short axis view at the aortic valve level okay this is the ra this is the tricuspid valve rvot and here is the pulmonary valve and this is the main pulmonary artery i will just say and this is the right pulmonary artery it's more prominent you know when you are doing and if the pulmonary artery appears so prominent just have a second look into this and here in the same main pulmonary artery if you see here you have on near the tricuspid valve you have again a mobile you have gone into mute mode i think Dr. i have not muted the host has muted okay hello hello yeah, yes no. yeah the host had muted me i have not muted so can you hear me yeah yeah yes. so if you see that there is a mobile there is a clot which is you know moving on it is just swinging and swinging across the pulmonary valve this is very important like this particular case by the time we did it when all of three of us were together but by the time i finished the echo and uh, i was calling up the primary who still is a colleague of uh, 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 akhilesh and uh, gunadhar the patient had one big grunt and he had a a systole flat you know yeah, so yeah. nothing much could be done about it and uh, there was another patient i saw at one of my previous centers who came like this and we thrombolyzed him and after the lysis uh, the clot actually disappeared so uh, these are very important things both diagnostically here i am just discussing the diagnostics and later on we'll discuss the therapeutics so this is a clot in the main pulmonary artery and i am telling you by god you see it it is not that you even a beginner if he, if he can image it properly will see it now since all of us start with in life by doing sub coastal views this is how it looks in the sub coastal views so in the sub coastal view this is the ra this is the rv and you can see a huge clot going across like a jula like a swing it's going across the uh, tricuspid valve okay i mean this is fine co anon there are no two ways about it if you change your angle of probe you know the size of ra rv can change but please memorize this image there are no two ways because these images are not compatible with life you forget risk stratification forget if you see this image it is a red flag the matter has to be escalated uh, i have not deliberately kept a uh, image of the ivc because i don't want the uh, discussion to go anywhere else 
so now we come back to the one of the most important take home messages if you have a d shaped lv in diastole it's a volume overload of the right ventricle and if you have a d shaped lv in systole it's a pressure overload of the right ventricle be very clear so if you are getting somebody who's coming in with a suspected venous thromboembolism okay or somebody who's been ventilated for ARDS for about a week you will typically see that this D comes out in end systole however if you're getting a patient of ILD who's got a clinical not a core pulmonal or ILD with a right heart failure or COPD with a core pulmonal or COPD with a right heart failure then you will find that the D will be present in diastole as well maybe in systole but it will be more prominent in diastole you know so this is as much as echo can tell you about things so acute core pulmonal to an intensivist if you get this echo the acute diagnosis is pulmonary embolism you need to rule it out you know so if you do if you can if you see the dilatation no clots then you please Remember that you need to do a venous Doppler of at least the femorals and the popliteals. And in case the patient is a dialysis patient or a cancer patient with a chemo port, just look at the axillary, the subclavian and the jugular veins also, please. I mean, this is what you can do at the bedside because if you find a clot, at least you can go ahead with the, uh, the treatment of either a lysis or an anticoagulation because the patient may not be fit to shift to a CT scanner. And if you don't find something, then the patient will have to be shifted to the CT scanner, which is a headache in itself because the patient may crash, may need intubation and additional resources. The second is ARDS. So all patients, most patients of ARDS develop pulmonary hypertension. So the incidence of acute core pulmonal is 20% in cases of ARDS as far as the EDEC MCQ goes based on a paper by the, I think, Michelle Slama. And of course, one of the common causes of acute core pulmonal is inappropriate ventilator settings. So actually, if you want to see how it happens postoperatively, you know, you can, if you see patients who come in with tidal volumes, say 600, 650, depending on the choice of the anesthetist or peep of 15 and 16, these are the times when you will find that this interventricular septum is denting into the uh, left ventricle. Always remember that there are other causes of interventricular septum not moving properly. So it may become an O and it may become a D, but sometimes you will find that it is neither an O or nor a D and it just keeps dancing in between. So typical causes of bouncy interventricular septum for the intensivist is a pre-existing or a new left bundle branch block or when you have put a pacing wire in the right ventricle or the patient per se has been uh, Paste has got a permanent pacemaker insertion done. Looking at it from the focus angle, you know, when for those of who do lung ultrasounds, many a times you have registrars who can do lung ultrasounds, but not echoes. Acute core pulmonal, and even if you look at the blue protocol of Daniel Lichtenstein, is a cause of dyspnea with no B lines. So, you know, causes of dyspnea without B lines is one is pulmonary embolism, and then you have COPD, bronchial asthmas. Now, in patients, when you find, if you're ICU patient, so typically if you find in the round that this patient has developed a hemodynamic compromise and when you're scanning and you find that yesterday was good, but today, you know, the RV appears a little dilated and the interventricular septum is going into the LV and systole. So if the plateau pressures are above 27, kindly bring it down by reducing the tidal volumes. If the plateau pressures are less than 27, but you still find that the septum is denting into the LV. And if the PSEO2 is still high, then you really need to, you can't go up on the uh, uh, tidal volume. You'll have to increase the respiratory rate to increase the minute ventilation, and you'll have to remove the HME filter to reduce the resistance of the airway. 
peep adjustment is extremely important and this is something which is easy to practice is how to titrate peep whichever way whether you are using the arts net table or you're using recruitment maneuvers or incremental decremental whatever you are doing remember one thing put a probe at any level of peep if your rv starts dilating and the septum starts denting it will compromise the hemodynamics and how it will compromise the hemodynamics, which we will see in the next section of the talk, that is ventricular interdependence. And of course, if the PF ratio is less than 150, you need to prone the patient. So how do we differentiate between acute core pulmonal, which is a echo diagnosis versus a chronic core pulmonal, which is what is taught to us as undergraduates and postgraduates in patients of chronic lung diseases like COPD, ILD. So in acute core pulmonal, typically you will have interventricular flattening and end systol. In chronic core pulmonal, you will have an interventricular flattening in systole and diastole, more in diastole. Now, acute core pulmonal is a pressure overload. Chronic core pulmonal is a volume overload. In acute core pulmonal, you will generally not have a significant TR jet. There may be a small jet because the function is acutely compromised. In chronic core pulmonal, you will have a significant TR jet if the RV function is normal. But if the RV function is compromised, then you're not going to have a TR jet. In acute core pulmonal, you will have no pulmonary artery hypertension. But in chronic core pulmonal, PAH will have been established. So when you measure the PASP by echocardiography, you will find that there is a uh, PA, uh, pulmonary hypertension. And in acute core pulmonal, you will not have a right ventricular hypertrophy. And in chronic core pulmonal, you will have a right ventricular hypertrophy. So in echo in the apical four chamber view, we can see the TR jet. From the TR jet, we calculate the PASP. And the RVH, we typically pick up from the subcostal view when we look at the free wall of the right ventricle. So now moving on from acute core pulmonal to the second part of the talk, and that is ventricular interdependence and its implications in critical care. So if you remember this cartoon and why it is important to remember this cartoon is this is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle. So my first question to the audience is then which ventricle is this little pet over here? Anybody can answer the question. You have the left ventricle, you have the right ventricle and they are walking away and the poor pet is running lest he gets crushed. Any takers? So any, any DNB students who are there can put their questions and uh, the answer in the chat box. No, no, you can uh, call back or you can talk. We need to, you really need to be very clear who is this person. So you have the left ventricle, the right ventricle. Anyway, any anybody? I think it's the right ventricle. No, the, so this is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. I'm talking about what is this? Who, what does this represent? The dog which is running away or uh, the fear of being crushed. And that is the whole reason I have put this lecture together from my experience. This is the intensivist who will get crushed if he doesn't understand the interactions between the left and the right ventricle. So it's uh, basically the mediator-like pulmonary cyst circulation. No, or... no, this is the intensivist. Okay. We had the fear of being crushed. Okay, because if you don't understand what's going on. Anyway, so now we move to again the, so this is a uh, short axis view at the papillary muscle level and you can see the LV and you can see the RV. This is a non LV and a RV. And now we look in the basic understanding of ventricular interdependence. So we take a view where we can see both the ventricles together and the best view is a short axis view at the papillary muscle level. First thing, LV is bigger, no doubts. Second, LV is stronger, no doubts. RV is like a golfer's cap sitting on the LV. And the RV moves largely due to the septal movement. So you have to understand that the interventricular septum is a part of the left ventricle. And when the interventricular septum moves, I think it contributes to almost two-thirds of the contractility of the right ventricle. 
therefore in practical in real life when you have when you write a anteroceptal or a, 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 a myocardial infarction you presume that there will be some drop in the rv systolic function okay this is one these are the normal interactions this is the second slide again we see the here again it's the short axis view papillary muscle level this is the right ventricle here this is the anterolateral and this is the posterior medial papillary muscles okay now in lv in this view we look at three things the lv preload that is the filling so if this lv is not filled adequately you will find that in end systole it just crumbles and both the papillary muscles which you can see go and kiss each other in end systole we look at the lv contractility and lv contractility is seen by the force with which all the lv walls come in and do a namaste in systole lv afterload is actually indirectly represented in this view when you find that there is a lv which appears to contract much more strongly than it would have contracted so if you see normal hearts you know okay it's running at it's beating at a particular speed uh, you know the rate the rate of moving in and suddenly you will find boss this heart seems to be extra strong and it's moving in with a much more vigorous force but when it is moving in with a much more vigorous force it is not crumbling in end systole so if you have a hypovolemic patient you will find that the heart beats you know it 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 moves in very fast but the papillary muscles kiss each other in end systole but if you have gross vasodilatation with relative hypovolemia you will find that the heart by god moves in very fast but the papillary muscles don't kiss each other in end systole and of course as far as this talk is concerned we look at the what is known as the eccentricity index now it is very important that for the eccentricity index you remember that you know one caliper moves from the septum to the free wall other caliper moves perpendicular to it this is only for exams but otherwise in real life we don't do it eyeballing is good enough so this is the what i had shown you and this is the view which tells us everything about acute core pulmonal and ventricular interdependence this is the anterior wall of the left ventricle a common mistake you know when we do because we don't get such cuts so if i am seeing this anteriorly i'll say are are this is anterior wall my probe is here no anterior wall of the left ventricle is where the lv and the rv and the interventricular septum hits so this is anterior wall of the left ventricle like you saw in the previous slide this anterior wall had come over here so be careful before you commit so this is anterior wall of the left ventricle this is the interventricular septum this is the uh, uh, papillary muscle this is the anterolateral and this is the posterior medial papillary muscle and this is how i think things are here uh, i'm sorry a part of it got cut out of this slide okay now what happens in acute core pulmonal this is acute core pulmonal asterix has the magic portion for those of you who have read the comics and he becomes bigger than obelix and magic portion and this is acute core pulmonal and that prototype is pulmonary embolism and ards so now we look at these cases just a second okay so what happens in acute core pulmonal there is a acute rv pressure overload and then this rv cannot handle the pressure so if rv cannot handle the pressure it is a thin and distensible chamber and it distends but even after distending you know there is huge pressure so there is a great amount of pressure in the rv cavity which as such causes a large amount of stress on the free wall of the rv which compromises the perfusion of the right ventricle and right ventricle is a chamber which gets better perfused in diastole but because of the increased pressures in the rv cavity the rv distends but despite that the there is a huge stress on the free wall of the rv and the rv perfusion is compromised similarly the stress is also evident on the interventricular septum which gets pushed into the lv 
the moment the interventricular septum is pushed into the lv you know the size of the lv cavity becomes small i agree that it is the push is most prominent in end systole but it is also present to some extent in mid systole and the right ventricular pressures can exceed the lv pressures initially in systole and later in diastole but even if the rv pressures exceed the lv pressures in mid to late systole two things happen one is that the left ventricular intra cavitary pressures they rise you know and the left ventricle by virtue of being pressed from outside it becomes stiffer the moment the left ventricle becomes stiffer the left ventricular pressures go up and therefore in diastole the filling of left ventricle goes down because the gradients between the mitral between the left atrium and the left ventricle are reduced so therefore the left ventricle preload reduces and the second thing is if the left ventricle preload or the filling is reduced the left ventricular stroke volume also reduces so therefore if you are thinking of a pathology of right ventricle like a pulmonary embolism remember the following rv systolic function goes down because the rv stroke volume is blocked rv diastolic dysfunction occurs because the rv is pressure overloaded and the dam walls are stretched out lv filling is compromised because the lv cavity is pressed from outside and the intra peric intra cavitary pressures go up and since the lv filling is compromised the lv stroke volume is also reduced and in top of all this there is right ventricular ischemia so for those of you who want to remember i can say this is if you take the exactly like you can say a tamponade of the lv is taking place when the rv distends up you have to understand this don't say ki you know because sometimes you ask for a echo and uh, you know with due respect the echocardiographer will write lv ef 60% rv distended and you know moving less and all but try and understand that the lv contractility is maintained but the filling has gone down the stroke volume has gone down so what the hell are you going to do with the contractility other than being misled you know that the lv is good yes the lv is good but like a hepatorenal the lv is compromised secondary to the rv dysfunction so this is it uh, this is the interventricular septum free wall of rv okay this side is the walls of the lv interventricular septum so now we look quickly at the echo findings in acute core pulmonary so if i have to objectively see the right ventricular systolic function i look at what is known as the right ventricular outflow tract vti that means i put my pulse wave doppler just before the pulmonary valve and i get this waveform this waveform is important for those of you who are interested you can measure this this is the time from onset of pulmonary flow to the peak of pulmonary flow and this is known as pulmonary acceleration time i am telling you why it is important because if you have if a pat is less than 100 milliseconds you it is you can think of pulmonary hypertension but if the pat is closer to 60 milliseconds definitely if you are thinking of a pulmonary embolism it is in so a pulmonary acceleration time is a measure is a way of getting the pulmonary artery systolic pressures in patients who don't have a tr jet or for doctors who are not very good at measuring the tr jet this is important the second thing why this waveform is important and i have not put the trace here is on this so this is the pulmonary flow starts it reaches a peak velocity so what i am trying to tell you if you are driving a vehicle down a empty road you can accelerate in less in very fast but but if if your if this time if this time is less 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 if the if this time is lesser and lesser and lesser it tells you that there's a problem and similarly here on the downside if you get a dichrotic notch that is again compatible with the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and it is known as the w shaped 
pulse wave doppler pattern of the pulmonary artery waveform and you know when you lyse these patients you find that the w disappears also i'm just telling you what are the related mcqs which are there so that's the importance of pulmonary acceleration time the other ways to measure the rv systolic function of course one is the tap say which we all do when we put the cursor at the lateral tricuspid annulus and then we see the movement so remember that the predominant movement of the free wall of the rv is in the longitudinal direction therefore tap say actually captures only this longitudinal motion it is a good surrogate for the global rv ejection fraction but this surrogate does not work when there is a infarction of the free wall of the rv or the free wall of the rv is involved in any other pathology of the heart similarly when you put a tissue doppler here in the same area you get this measure which is a measure of the movement of the rv free wall towards the apex which is known as s prime so tap say i think we take a cut off of about 15 to 17 and s prime we take a cut off of more than 9 as good rv ef one of the things we measure in these settings is the tricuspid jet and if we look at the tricuspid jet and if we transduce it we get the maximum velocity of the tricuspid jet and if we do a 4v square of the maximum velocity we get the right ventricular systolic pressures and on top of it if we add the cvp and i will not discuss here how cvp is added there are many ways you get the pulmonary artery systolic pressures but remember the gradients are reduced when the rv function is reduced so the clinical implication is like this you have a patient say your own patient copd core pulmonal right heart failure his pasp is about uh, 65 you know last echo he's got minimal swelling he gets breathless on say mrc grade 2 and 3 and this time he was good and you know everything was good and suddenly he comes with a acute breathlessness and this time you find ki boss he is not wheezing also there is no exacerbation of copd and he is breathless and if you look at the tr jet and if the tr jet now you are getting a pasp of around 35 40 which is significantly less than the previous psp you presume that the rv function has dropped and then you objectively look and see if the rv function is dropped and if the rv function is dropped then your diagnosis in this patient is venous thromboembolism unless proved otherwise 20% of exacerbations of copd a copd are due to venous thromboembolism so these are the clinical uh, practical implications now we look at a slightly more difficult topic which i have put it here so if in this ventricular interdependence i have told you that the lv gets a lot of pressure from outside and therefore it becomes a very stiff chamber so if it becomes a stiff chamber how do we realize it so for those of us who do this it's good for those of us who do only mcqs and not echo for them also this is good so if you look at the mitral inflow from the la into the lv the first wave is known as the e wave which is the early filling and second wave is known as the a wave which is a atrial contraction so if you have a nice healthy lv it will open up every time and it will say le pani dal de and you know the e wave will have a nice robust velocity and a wave will be always lesser than the e wave but as the lv becomes the lv relaxation gets impaired it becomes a little stiff you know the lv pressures go up and then like you know it's like filling air into a football now which is half full it's not so easy so that e wave velocity comes down because the lv filling pressures are high and the a wave has to work much more to contract and push more blood into the lv so this is the grade 1 diastolic dysfunction but let's forget that let's look at the relationship between the e and the a okay so what i am trying to tell you if suppose you had a patient who had a Uh, who was good i mean a young person who went some time back he was post covid he got a echo echo was normal echo said e by a ratio is 1.2 now this guy comes and you suspecting a venous thromboembolism and you find that the e by a ratio instead of 1.2 is actually it's about 0.6 or 0.7 what does it tell you it tells you boss that the it's point 3 here that the filling of the lv is getting compromised so if this guy has got a dilated ra dilated rv flattening septum it tells you that the lv has started 
getting stiffer and the LV filling is compromised. The other thing what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, these pressure uh, patients will get breathless very easily. They'll have high left uh, left atrial pressures or left ventricular filling pressures. But if they are hypotensive, you may need to give them some fluid because they are not hypovolemic. They're just getting breathless because the LV pressures are increasing because of the stiffness of the LV and not because of volume overload of the LV as is typically seen in the prototype cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Then if the LV gets more stiff, you know, you find that the LV pressures are rising. So because of the rise in LV pressure, some this rise is also transmitted to the LA. Therefore, you find that now the LV pressures are up, the LA pressures are up. Therefore, the E-wave velocity increases to a certain extent. And I'll not discuss this in detail. And then after some time, you find that the E-wave has become much bigger than the A wave. That means the E by A ratio typically has become more than two. That means the LV is compromised. It is, it is stiff to such an extent that the E by A ratio has become more than two, right? So here what happens is if the E is less than A, it's known as grade one diastolic dysfunction. If the E by A is almost the same grade two, if E by A is more than three, it's grade three diastolic dysfunction. So if you call a cardiologist, he will write the grades of diastolic dysfunction and go. But if you call an intensivist who does echoes, he will tell you, boss, the filling was compromised, E was less, but now the pressures are going up and now the pressures are very high. So therefore, definitely this patient will be breathless. He may have a low PaO2, but he may or may not be hypovolemic in a setting of acute core pulmonal because this pressure on the LV is not, is not because of the disease of the LV. This this changes in E by A patterns are because of the extrinsic compression of the LV and not because of the diseases of the LV. So for the purpose of cardiology description, they can be written as grade one, two, three diastolic dysfunction. But for the intensive care, it just tells you that the filling pressures of the left side of the heart are increased. That means your acute core pulmonal is by God significant. So, you know, you have many settings for those of us who do with pulmonary embolism that you may have a situation where, you know, you see all this, but the patient somehow, the patient is not hypotensive. He's still normotensive. So those of us who stick to the guidelines will say, boss, no time for thrombolysis. No, still not a candidate for thrombolysis. You know, he's got an acute core pulmonal. You know that the LV pressures are high. So therefore, if this patient gives, gets hypotensive, the moment you get a, give him a little more fluids, he'll just go into frank pulmonary edema. Therefore, this is a candidate who may better come out with a reperfusion strategy provided the criteria like, you know, the troponin is left or the RV dysfunction worsens. So this is how you objectively do. So you cannot say na, that this is right heart failure. I will not give fluids. No, patient has got elevated left ventricular filling pressures. You can just give him a small fluid challenge to see if he can tolerate it. Of course, we don't do the pulmonary inflow patterns, but pulmonary veins flow into the uh, left atrium. So if the left atrium pressures are high, the systolic wave gets compromised. I will not go into this further. And then we come to the last part of the LV is that does it, how does it affect? So I've told you that the LV becomes stiff, not because of a disease producing diastolic dysfunction, because of an extrinsic compression. And therefore, how we do the filling pressures of the left ventricle is we take the velocity of the E wave of the mitral inflow pattern and we check it out with the velocity of the E prime of the tissue Doppler across the mitral annulus, medial aspect or a lateral aspect. I will not go into that. But remember, E by E prime is one of the best ways to measure non-invasively the left ventricular filling pressures or the left atrial pressures. E comes from the mitral inflow pattern. That means the blood flowing across the mitral valve into the ventricle. And E prime actually comes from not from the blood flow, but from the movement, the speed of movement of the mitral annulus towards the cardiac apex and back away from the cardiac apex. 
okay so if i if the good heart it will contract well it will relax well if it's a bad heart it will not contract well so many of you who measure this is known as the s prime of the la, uh, left ventricle and it will not relax also so you know your relaxation wave the e prime will not be this big it will be small so tissue doppler tells you the speed of movement of a tissue good tissue moves fast towards the apex and comes back fast to the baseline bad tissue moves slowly towards the apex and comes back slowly to the baseline so you see how we have started in a setting of a acute rv dysfunction we are navigating the left ventricular filling pressures and i'll tell you why it is important so therefore in such in any critically ill ventilated patients and even if it is acute core pulmonal if you have a septal e prime of less than 8 that means this is a heart which is relaxing very slowly you know and this indicates that there is a lv diastolic dysfunction that means i will tell you for the outpatient cardiology lv diastolic dysfunction can be lvh sarcoidosis amyloidosis aortic stenosis for the intensive care unit a left ventricular diastolic dysfunction one of course in a setting of sepsis the heart is known to become stiff and it can have its own uh, impaired relaxation and increase in stiffness but in intensive care units we see what is known as other causes or extrinsic causes of lv diastolic dysfunction say pressure from a uh, dilated rv especially pressure overload of the or during cardiac tamponade you know when there are there is a extrinsic pressures these pressures go up and of course we will not grade them in the intensive care unit and in the icu we always look at e by e prime if it's more than 14 it tells us that the left atrial or the left ventricular end diastolic pressures are elevated okay so this is very clear so when you are managing the rv you also have to realize what is happening to the lv okay we may not treat because here the lv is not the primary pathology the rv is the primary pathology so either you thrombolyze or you do a catheter based lysis or you do a embolectomy your lv function will automatically improve okay but there are some implications which we will see and last part is how does it affect the lv systolic function so we measure the systolic function by the lvot vti which we take in the apical five chamber view normal is about 20 and you find that as the pulmonary embolism physiology worsens you will find that the lv stroke volume goes down but still if you get a cardio the diagnosis will be lv ef 60% because ef is 60% we are not interested in ef why is the lv stroke volume going down because the lv preload is going down the lv filling is going down can you increase the lv filling by giving fluids yes i can increase the lv filling by giving fluids what is the harm the potential problem the potential problem is that the lv filling pressures are very high if i give even a small amount of fluids the patient is high risk to slip into pulmonary edema of course we look at fluid responsiveness of the lv and this is how so for the lvot vti those of who are seeing if you reduce the sweep speed that means instead of capturing one or two loops you are capturing about 10 loops over here and you see the swings i am not discussing it in detail why i am showing you this image is a particular reason you see the swings so for those of us i'll re read it the other way sir what are dynamic markers of fluid responsiveness so dynamic markers of fluid responsiveness one of them is stroke volume variation how do you see stroke volume variation you see stroke volume variation on the echo by the swings in the lvot vti name some causes of false positive swings in the lvot vti in echo where the patient is not fluid responsive and the answer is right heart failure the reason i am showing you this is don't jump and give fluids if you are seeing this in every patient of right heart failure you will find that there is a increase in swings and which is known as a false positive stroke volume variation on echo or on vigilio or a false positive pulse pressure variation as you will see on an arterial line so therefore the last three concluding slides is ventricular interdependent interdependence in acute core pulmonal if acute rv dysfunction is present 
check whether it is pressure or volume overload or contractility of the RV. Remove cause of pressure overload, that is the afterload, by tackling pulmonary embolism, reducing the PEEP, reducing the tidal volume, and IAP is reducing the intra-abdominal pressures. If volume overload, give diuretics to tackle volume or preload overload. Use inopressors as temporary support for reduced contractility. Fluid responsiveness for the LV is not reliable in this setting as the pulse pressure variation may be false positive. Now, for those of you who attended yesterday's webinar on fluids from the ESICM, there's something I learned. So what they say is, if you have a right heart failure and if you are getting these uh, swings in PPV and SVV, there is a possibility it may be false positive. There is a possibility it may not be false positive. So what you do, you do a passive leg raising. Now, if you do a passive leg raising, so in a case of right heart failure, who has got swings in PPV more than 10, 12%. And if you're doing a passive leg raising and the swings in PPV are coming down, that means by God, it is a correct increase in the swings of PPV. But if you do a passive leg raising and which is like a endovascular in a intrinsic fluid challenge, and you find that despite a fluid challenge of passive leg raising, the swings in PPV are not coming down. That means these swings are not related to uh, fluid responsiveness, they are related to right heart failure. RV dysfunction pushes the septum into LV. This reduces the LV and diastolic volume. It also produces LV diastolic dysfunction as it makes the LV more stiff. Hence, LV diastolic dysfunction results in an elevated left atrial pressure even if the LV filling volume is low. So therefore, measuring the pulmonary artery occlusion or the wedge pressures from a swan Gans catheter may not give a true picture. And this happens in post-operative cardiac surgical patients. It may not be a venous thromboembolism. Sometimes you have a when you have a swan Gans and you are treating pulmonary edema because you are finding boss uh, PASP is 25 by 15. Now it has become 40 by 20. And therefore, you know, give diuretics and do this. Actually, when the problem is something else, it is something else which is driving the rise in POOP. Therefore, don't go up on the false pathway. So in a post-op cardiac surgical setting, if you're getting a rise in P uh, in the pulmonary artery wedge pressures or the PASP, you're getting a rise in the CVP because they are all monitored in, then always think of a tamponade, something similar, you know, it's compressing it. Use echocardiography to detect LV and RV and diastolic volumes. This will give a better correlation with PAOP. This interdependence is a dynamic process depending on the trajectory of the cause. Bad ventilator settings, the boss sets it in the morning. Your uh, this uh, acute core pulmonal will disappear. Arts developing pulmonary hypertension, you prone the patient or you uh, take him on inhaled nitric oxide or you take him on ECMO, again, it will disappear. Okay, venous thromboembolism, you lyse it, it disappears. Therefore, for every respiratory and cardiac compromise, please use echocardiography in association with clinical ABG and lab parameters. I think that is all I have from my talk. And uh, thank you for a very, very patient listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vivek. I think it's a wonderful talk and I think you have covered everything and in a very detailed manner. And uh, probably uh, the people who are more interested in echocardiography, this is a uh, very good uh, session for them. But most of the intensivists, uh, I think, uh, sometimes uh, do echo as a bedside screening tool uh, to measure the point of care uh, uh, interventions like giving a fluid or giving a, or starting an inotrope. So uh, uh, with us, uh, Dr. Pradeep, sir. So I just request Dr. Pradeep, sir, uh, if he can able to demonstrate us some of the few clinical scenarios, how echo can be useful in the bedside, whether to start inotrope or whether to give fluids in a say, very simplified and lucid manner. I think it will be helpful to most of our intensivists. And correlating with the clinical parameters, like suppose in a patient with post-cardiac post transplant or a patient with cardiomyopathy who is coming on failure or a patient with ARDS, which is getting ventilated or patient of COPD. Right. So uh, I think you're talking about whether the patient is, hello? Yes, sir. You can hear you. Yeah. Whether the patient is actually fluid responsive or non-fluid responsive. Yes, sir. I think that is the question which you've asked and 
with this responsiveness you have it with special situations where there may be abnormal ivcs but clinically the whether the person is fluid depleted or not yes sir yes sir now whenever you have a normal heart that means the contractility is normal and you have an ivc i would say the ivc which is collapsible or by eyeballing looks like more than 50% variable i mean the difference between inspiration and expiration is more than 50% we would presume these patients to be fluid responsive this is a simple one initially dehydrated patients simple one the complications arise when you start pumping in fluids now if you presume that this particular patient has given 2 liters of fluids and after giving 2 liters of fluids you are still in a fix as to whether more fluids should be given or whether vasopressors should be added this is the answer which you want from the bedside absolutely now, in this particular case some of the points we would use are from that beautiful lecture by dr vivek in that definitely we would try to do now a passive leg raising test on this particular patient and if there is an increase in the diameter i would say around 12 to 15% over the baseline it could well indicate that this person could still be fluid responsive in addition to this passive leg raising test remember don't forget to look at the lungs so if you have a lung pattern when you started with to be of the a lung profile a lung profile means a dry lung profile and as you're pumping in more and more fluids you find b lines appearing that means the lungs are getting wet and probably at this point you've reached probably the up limit of your fluids and you require to give pressors now despite this particular this is a simple way in which which there are no complications in the heart you can have good plr raising if despite this you feel that the person is clinically underfilled and you want to objectively find out you would definitely look at the lvot vti and the variations which was shown in a particular slide by dr vivek again and again i would say in simple terms if the variations are more than 12 to 15% beat to beat variations and like he said reduce the sweep speed beat to beat variations more than 12 to 15% that person is likely to be fluid responsive if the line is absolutely straight at the lvot vti that particular person is likely to be not fluid responsive and require to add pressers if that person is hypotensive so i hope that in a nutshell summarizes it's a vast thing but i think these are the basic things which we would do look at the ivc look at the variability not getting a conclusion from the ivc and variability try a plr not getting a conclusion from the plr and ivc or variability look at the lvot vti another important point if the ivc is not visualized because of the distension of the stomach or gases or whatever is happening sometimes we look at the internal jugular vein and the internal jugular vein distensibility index it's not compressibility index it's a distensibility index which would then give you an idea of the pleural preload responsiveness and if in these circumstances you could also do a plr and look at the jugular distensibility as a response to the plr yeah thank you thank you sir and sir the same thing applies to the spontaneously breathing patient and uh, mechanically ventilated patient or the, 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 these particular rules usually as per all the nomenclature are in a mechanically ventilated patient but in our day to day critical care practice i utilize these for non ventilated as well as ventilated of course it is important that you look at all the parameters together and not only one parameter so gunadar if i can just add to that and i'm reasonably fresh because i suggest everybody should go back and see that yesterday's web esicm webinar on fluids so passive leg like all these patients as the dr de costa said were first validated in mechanically ventilated sedated and paralyzed but for patients who are spontaneously breathing 
whether without ventilation or even on a mechanical ventilator, passive leg, leg raising does work. But the point about passive leg raising is that you need to measure a change in stroke volume or cardiac output. So if the patient, either you do it by echo, or you will have to go to what is known as advanced hemodynamic monitoring. That means either flow track or vigilio, whatever you have in your unit. The second thing is end expiratory occlusion. End expiratory occlusion also works well, but it works well only in mechanically ventilated, sedated and paralyzed patients. And here, of course, the thing is that the change in cardiac output is so small that you cannot pick it up by echo. So one of the MCQs, things I learned later in, you need to have at least a five to 10% change in cardiac output to convincingly pick it up by echocardiography. Therefore, if you're doing an end expiratory maneuver, you need to have one of the advanced hemodynamic monitoring gadgets, which gives you a continuous stroke volume uh, variation, right? Now, other than that, the third thing is a tidal volume challenge. Now, this tidal volume challenge also works best in mechanically ventilated, sedated, and paralyzed patients. And it also produces a change in cardiac output. But here, again, you will need an advanced hemodynamic monitoring gadget. So if we have to do a passive leg raising in a spontaneously breathing patient who does not have anything, we use an echo. If we have to do a passive leg raising in a spontaneously breathing patient who has an arterial line, then we can look at the swings in the pulse pressure variation. Thanks. So uh, one of the questions is asked by uh, Dr. Sudhi. So basically, she wants to know how exactly is the internal jugular vein distensibility checked, sir? And how does, how does this procedure is performed? Uh, Dr. Neeraj uh, or uh, Dr. Deepak, if you can answer this. I think let us uh, Neeraj, sir. So uh, it's it's exactly the same way you check for IBC, you check for the jugular vein sensibility index. But the problem is is the percentage is slightly different, and one also needs to understand because it is in the spontaneously breathing patient. Anybody who is actively expiring, you do not do at the end of inspiration. You do it just at, at the end of expiration, but rather you try to match it when they are about to begin their inspiration so that the more pronounced effects are not shown in the distensibility index. And uh, what about the, uh, the correlation of uh, the downstream markers along with the echocardiography to come to a hemodynamic monitoring uh, uh, for the patient to give a fluid or not? So uh, does the correlation match properly or uh, uh, you have to only rely on the echo and uh, the uh, other uh, point of care gadgets to give fluid and vasopressin? Uh, I think Dr. DeCosta and uh, Dr. Deep do things if you can take from their talk is that it has to be a holistic assessment rather than a single parameter. For example, when I have a patient who is an ARDS, then if you're going to put whatever probe, you're going to have lots and lots of B lines. No confusion about it. The confusion is whether I can give fluid to this patient when this patient starts to go hemodynamically compromised. So the simplest thing, if you have a good uh, modern day ventilator is to have a PPP turned on on these patients all the time. And anybody who is having reasonably filled up, you will not see pulse pressure variation on the ventilator. The second thing is, obviously, if you are well-versed with echocardiography, yeah, you can put a probe, you can look at all those things and all those parameters that Dr. Vivek has described. But I would like to go back to the conventional definition of acute core pulmonale, which is very simple. At the level of papillary muscle, in the short axis, you look at the RV and diastolic area and LV and diastolic area. The moment it is more than 0.6, the ratio, you suspect this patient is having acute core permolale. And then you look at the septum. If the septum is shifted towards the left atrium, your patient is having acute core permolale. So now we have defined a situation in which I have a patient who is in ARDS, who is hemodynamically compromised, but he's out of bound to fluid therapy because all the sign is having acute core permolale. 
And this is the time probably one needs to look at the therapeutic intervention one needs to do. As Dr. Deepak really beautifully pointed out, there can be certain things which could be amenable to treatment. One of them is setting of ventilator. The study that he was quoting uh, is really important in one factor that it also sensitizes all our intensivists that it's not the amount of PEEP you are giving because those who were on just five centimeters of PEEP, they had as much chances of developing uh, acute call pulmonale as they were on 15 centimeter of PEEP. So it is the combined effect in that patient that we need to look and rather than giving in a patient who is hemodynamically compromised, any kind of fluid, if they are having right ventricle compromise, it is better to start them straight away on norepinephrine. And then there are certain targets one can have. One is uh, to have your uh, arterial CO2 targets less than 50. You can also try to have your driving pressures manipulated. And if you are ventilating at 8 ml per uh, kg, try to bring it out to 7 ml per kg. So all these things combined, they have an effect rather than going only for a single downstream parameter or echocardiographic parameter because they are dynamic. For example, your E by A will definitely change the moment you uh, reduce your peak from 14 to 10 or it will change vice versa if you increase the peak. So rather than looking at one parameter, see how the parameter is changing with intervention. And that's, that's, that's uh, PLR is something uh, which has taught us. So Gunadhar, that was a very good extension of what I spoke. I just want to say, let's be very clear that there is whatever I have discussed, echo-based hemodynamics is all macro circulation. Okay, and the downstream markers may not improve even if you optimize the macro circulation if your micro circulation is compromised which is typically seen prototype in septic shock and it can also occur in late stages of cardiogenic shock when it gets compromised so i think the entire talk today is optimization of the upstream markers perfusion actually depends on the micro circulation because that is the final endpoint so even after doing all this if your micro circulation is compromised you know then either you have not treated the sepsis properly or if you have treated the sepsis properly, you can go on to using medications which are not part of this lecture. Yes. So, uh, so simply one thing would be like, uh, uh, as Dr. DeCosta said, it has to be algorithmic approach. So first you do your preload measurement right. Then you look at if, if my patient is not preloaded well, but is my patient suffering with RV failure? So which definitely rules out further fluid supplementation despite my patient being LV fluid responsive. RV will not absorb that fluid, which it needs to transit into the LV, period. Then you start with your vasopressors, then inotropes, and all these combines, then you look at your downstream markers and see how they are trending with the change. If this is not happening, go back to your initial assessment, relook what probably got overlooked. Well, that's fantastic. I have two questions uh, to ask. Uh, basically, if uh, uh, LVOT, VTI uh, index is also very important, E by E prime is very important to diagnose, probably uh, LV overload and all that. So if the patient has aortic regurgitation, would these uh, values be reliable? Or what is the uh, assumption that we need to have in such circumstances as far as E by E, by e prime calculation is concerned, LVOT, VTI index is also not reliable in this situation. My question is to everyone, I mean, the speaker. Yeah, so Aklesh, I'll take that question. So yeah. what we discussed, of course, we presumed that the valves were normal. Yeah. When you have regurgitations, and especially left heart, aortic and mitral, you presume that you are driving a gadi which is half filled with water or you are handling a football which is already half filled with air. By virtue of having regurgitation, I understand that there is a volume overload of the left heart. By virtue of this volume overload, the if it is chronic, the left atrium and the left ventricle may be enlarged. By virtue of this volume overload, definitely the pressures of the left atrium and the left ventricle will be raised. 
by virtue of having raised pressures, these patients will be at higher risk of pulmonary edema from something like a 100 ml fluid challenge. By virtue of having these raised pressures, they will not tolerate a distension of the RV as much as a healthy non-regurgitation individual will tolerate. By virtue of having these raised pressures, they will not tolerate a cardiac tamponade. They will become symptomatic much early. And the last thing which I want all intensivists to remember is all these regurgitation patients have false high EFs. So if you tell me grade 2 MR and the EF is 65%, I will not even bother. But if you tell me, sir, patient has got moderate to severe MR and the EF is 50%, reported as normal? No. That means there is definitely a compromise with chronic regurgitations. You know, the heart becomes hypercontractile. Why the hell has the EF dropped? Is this patient relatively hypovolemic or has there been a compromise in contractility? So that is how I look at it. Dr. Pradeep, the question, you have some difference of opinion. No. I no, any... I agree with regurgitant uh, lesions. You have to be very, very cautious and you should take utmost care in interpreting these values with regurgitant lesions. Absolutely correct. So wow. Your E by E prime does not work with regurgitant. You don't do tissue dopplers with regurgitant. You will always have a high E wave. You will always have very high E by E prime. You will have high wedge pressures. But I'll tell you, for the intensivist, if the patient has got regurgitation, doesn't matter. I will go by my trends. If I am seeing that the patient is worsening and the filling pressures are increasing, that means definitely there is a problem of either uh, uh, the contractility of the LV or there is a hypervolemia. And if I, as an intensivist, I am finding no, that the pressures are falling. So the typical story I'll tell you, uh, known case of aortic stenosis, you know, uh, not symptomatic or whatever, mildly symptomatic, awaiting a TAVI, now comes in with a urosepsis, right? And when you find that this aortic, tight aortic stenosis comes in with a urosepsis and the patient is a systolic of 80. So obviously, if you call up the cardiologist, he'll say, yeah, be very careful, he's got aortic stenosis. But if you have to work as an intensivist, I just open the file and I look at the mean gradients across the aortic valve. If the mean gradients across the aortic valve were, say, 65, now when the patient has come in urosepsis and the mean gradients across the aortic valve are, say, 45, definitely the cause of drop of the mean gradient is hypovolemia, which can be relative due to vasodilatation of sepsis, or it can be absolute due to an ongoing GI bleed. And it can also be due to an acute MI which this patient has sustained where there is a drop in contractility. So if you just compare the mean gradients with the previous gradients, and if there is a drop, so aortic stenosis cannot heal on its own. So if the gradients have dropped, definitely the patient most probably needs volume if it is a situation for sepsis. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, we, we always assume that, you know, uh, we have patient with ARDS and uh, he won't be in supine position most of the time. And I, if I have to do a 2D echocardiography for a patient with the ARDS and who is in prone position ventilation, already on very high PEEP and high FiO2, and, uh, you know, suddenly patient deteriorates and I want to do 2D echocardiography for that patient and just want to assess uh, RARB dilatation or pressure overload. So what will be the best way to analyze uh, which view we should go for uh, in this uh, situation to identify uh, the problems associated with probably RV overload or LV overload? You can do it with the subcostal view in the prone position only. Just put your hand below and place the probe. You'll get it. There was a case report to this. Now I'm forgetting which journal. It was somewhere on the Twitter. It's very easy. And in COVID patients also, we had to do echoes. So you just push. And even when patients are prone, now you get some space because the abdomen is not to be compressed. Just push on your hand in the subcostal space. You will get a good subcostal view. That is one view which you can get. Otherwise, you can see from the left uh, axillary and infra-axillary area, you will be able to address the heart. And even from the prone position, you can see the heart. Of course, you can't take measures, but subcostal view works. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, uh, we had similar patient who had ARDS and uh, ventilated with uh, prone positioning and he developed pulmonary embolism. 
and uh, we had to make him supine and then identify that was a disaster but at least luckily we could save that patient so this is good objective and uh, basically good uh, uh, suggestion uh, if we can do subcostal view uh, weaving of the heart i think that will give you enough idea but most of the times it's very difficult at times as well subcostal view also may not be optimum enough you know but yes i mean the other areas uh, can also be used like uh, parasternal uh, long axis view and uh, parasternal short axis view also it can be done in prone position yeah so if the, yeah yeah so we have, we have we have two questions in the uh, this chat box basically for dr deepak or if subhadeep is there subhadeep is also our colleague he is uh, working as a critical care intensivist so basically uh, the uh, uh, question from dr masood uh, is the dnb uh, student uh, so uh, the question is uh, validity of the lvot vti variability in patients with uh, raised intraabdominal pressure and so to dr deepak um uh, thank you for the question sir i would believe i think that vivek or that uh, pradeep sir are the better question but i as i understand i think obviously any pressures the it will change and i think you would not depend too much on it and i always my i'm like my approach would be depends on the clinical situation so as the pressures in the abdomen increases obviously it will transmit to the heart and we will really not depend on it i would like to hear from the other seniors yeah, so one of the settings for false positive swings in lvot vti is whenever the rv let's keep it very conceptual and simple so when the rv outflow is blocked you know that poor rv cannot pump out you know all these swings they increase it does not indicate fluid responsiveness means so normally fluid uh, this uh, swings in lv ot vti are generated because of the heart lung interactions which are different in both uh, spontaneously breathing and sedated and paralyzed patients but in any setting if the rv is compromised because its flow is blocked whether it is a venous thromboembolism whether it's a tension pneumothorax whether it's a cardiac tamponade whether it's a uh, intraabdominal hypertension there will be swings which do not connote necessarily connote a uh, fluid responsiveness and uh, the other question is from krishna chaitanya to uh, regarding uh, the igv distensibility reliability in severe ascites so is the ivc is not reliable in uh, intraabdominal pressure i think dr deepak already answered that anything which changes intraabdominal pressure or any pressure which is transmitting to the thoracic cavity then those kvrc will always hold true and so whichever it is it would be a venous system i think as yes. precisely precisely so anything which is compromising uh, your pressures either in the even in the pleural cavity there are so many times when you have ascites which is translating into increased pleural pressure even then these these uh, numbers they are not sacrosanct but yes remember one thing if you are looking at the trends they will give you some idea for example what we used to talk about cvp if your cvp changes after a particular maneuver it used to be a fluid challenge earlier it could be a tidal volume challenge now and the pressure changes in one particular direction that trend still remains sacrosanct so i would just like to add for all the intensivists boss body is one cavity one and you have intracranial pressures and on the other hand you have intra abdominal pressures there is always a transmission and you have to understand the concept so if the intra abdominal pressure goes up you know obviously the cardiac pressures right sided will go up and if the right sided pressures go up all sequential the ivc the igv they will all become start distending without a without actually predicting fluid responsiveness so it is all linked and i think this concept is coming in a big way which i wanted to discuss once with dr de costa actually but we'll fix it known as vexus i think we just need to sit and discuss because it is not about doing vexus it is about understanding how venous congestion is the cause of spoiling liver kidney and other organs and outcomes rather than the drop in map you know so you know all these pressures are it is one body yeah? you press my abdomen obviously my this thing and if i have a massive uh, pleural effusion so it is like a extra cardiac tamponade 
you will so if i have a massive pleural effusion and if the cardiologist writes grade 3 diastolic dysfunction and after that you remove 1.5 liter next day the next cardiologist will write grade 1 diastolic dysfunction so it is that is why this specialty is coming for the intensivist because we are there so always do the trends you know there is no harm it takes 10 extra minutes you put the probe everywhere and then go and find the answer for yourself Yes. I would just extend the same thing, sir. What sir is saying, uh, you you see people blaming CVP, and uh, the same vena system is a and they will be they will be applauding the IVC. So I believe it depends on the rider rather than the ride actually. No, no. And the thing is, you know, I'll tell you, intensivists get blamed. Today as an intensivist, I have written, say, you know, E by A more than two. And then the evening, the patient is tapped. Next day morning, Professor Emeritus uh, turns up and he's, hey, E by A to is 0.8 only. So, kya hai tere ko? And then, you know, around the hospital, the bus goes that this guy doesn't know. But actually what has happened, 1.5 liters of pleural fluid has gone down. So obviously any, any, any uh, LV physiology is going to improve. So it is also to protect ourselves, you know. You yes. need to be very clear. Absolutely. So the next question is for Pradeep sir. I think uh, patient on inotropes and vasopressors can confound our echo assessment and what is the margin of error in this interpretation from Ketan, Dr. Ketan Karigwar. Patients on inotropes and vasopressors can confound the echo assessment. And what is the margin of error? I actually did not understand this question in Toto. Uh, I believe if the vasopressors and anotropes can uh, actually influence the direct measurements. No, yes. no, it's a wrong question, Ketan. Yeah. We do. So, <laughs> so, I, so I think this question is extension to what Dr. Deepak is saying. Mm -hmm. So probably you look at your LV uh, when your norepinephrine was just two bytes. And yeah. then you look at your LV when your uh, norepinephrine has gone to 25 bytes. So your interpretation may change. And sometimes you, get a, so, sometimes you get a very falsely high ejection fraction in the presence of uh, I assume, uh, more I you, So when, when we do the echoes by an intensivist, we write a few things. One is the ventilator settings. Second is, so you need to have the tidal volume, the peep. You need to know whether the patient is paralyzed. Okay, and you also need to know what is the dose of noradrenaline, adrenaline, vasopressin, dobutamine. Because when we are working on those settings as intensivists, we take out the stroke volumes. It is understood that if the dose of noradrenaline goes up, definitely the stroke volume may falsely go up or it may go down depending if the primary pathology has worsened. Okay, so you have to, even if you see all the performance for ICU echocardiography, Patient is on ventilator, yes, no, sedated, paralyzed, yes, no. Patient is on vasopressor, inotrope, all that has to be mentioned. And typically, intensivists do not mention ejection fractions. We play around with stroke volumes. So we had a patient in exactly in our same hospital before where the morning the echo was done and the cardiologist wrote EF 60%. But unfortunately, he did not mention that it was NORAD 15 ml, ADRI 15 ml, and vasopressin 2.4 ml per hour. And in the evening when the patient died, everybody he said, Are, utto EF to 60%, the case mar gaya. Kaise mar gaya? because EF was 60%. I know. So, again, see, there is a difference between comprehensive echocardiography by the cardiologist versus a in ICU echocardiography. And those of you who want to know, just go to the ESICM website for the EDEC. There is a free performer, just download the performer. You know, because all these things change our interpretations. And if I may add, I think uh, most of the intensive will, will agree. Why we are doing that echocardiography or ultrasound at that particular moment? For example, what Dr. Deepak said, the, the echo was done to see what in a patient who is in extremis on such high doses of vasopressors, was it done to rule out pulmonary embolism as ca cause of hemodynamic compromise? Or was it show, uh, done to see whether my patient is still having a bit of scope of fluid resuscitation? And when you repeat, it is always advisable to see how much fluid you have pumped in since morning to this patient. Because again, your distensibility indexes, uh, which are validated, but the ranges are slightly higher or the collapsibility indexes, they, they will vary as per the fluid uh, intake that you have given to the patient. Yes. So uh, what is the uh, best book to study ECHO? So Dr. Sony to uh, Dr. Vivek. If you so can read the fellows. My side, the best book is Dr. Daniel DeBaker's book on hemodynamic, echo-based hemodynamic monitoring. 
on Amazon, it's I think 10,500, almost eight years after publication. But those of you who are interested, just share your Gmail ID with me. I have it on Google Drive. I'll share it. I've shared it with at least 200 people across India. I don't mind sharing it because I got it from one of the European delegates only. So I think that remains the best book. And if you have anything, you can always, uh, you know, post a query and ask. But that is by far the best book. Uh, if I may add, uh, for me, at least at a beginner level, I think uh, listening to the seniors daily, I'm like, try to have find a habit of using the echo. I'm like, you need to get that inhibition out of your mind. Try to use that probe, get the machine into your ICU if it's not there and uh, make as many mistakes as possible. In the morning, again, uh, as you present the patient, you present the echo as well and try to get uh, beatings from your senior, whatever it may be. And at the same time, I, if I usually give half an hour or one hour time in the afternoons to go to the echo room and uh, again learn and come back so that they'll get both the approaches from, from the intensivist one from the proper echocardiographer. And YouTube is actually pretty useful for yeah, And for the very beginners, now there's a beautiful book by Echo Made Easy by Sam Kudora. Sam Kudora is the person who works with Anthony McLean in Australia. It's not very costly. I think it's about 1200, 1400 rupees now. So every page has got like one page will have plaques view. Second will have papillary muscle view. Third will have you this thing. Uh, it's a very good book. It's about, I think 1200 rupees. Sam Kodora echo made easy for beginners. I say this is, this remains by far the best book. I would uh, suggest uh, there's a book called Figenbaum. Now, if people want to actually read the intricacies, and usually there is a CD or an interactive sort of uh, edition along with this book. That Figenbaum should be the third one. I think you all should be also just looking at once. Figenbaum it is the Bible, actually. You know, that is one thing. So I think you can start with that Sam Kodora. And you should always, you know, in your free time, even if you don't read Figenbaum, just see the images and just see what is written below. The, the images, images are really interesting and very crisp and clear. Yeah. Any, any channels, YouTube channels are available? Simplified channels where the beginners can learn. Yeah, there are, but offhand, I don't remember anything, but there are good channels as such. But the best channel is your own echo machine here. Do it, capture it, and you know, uh, get corrected. Do it, capture it, get connected. Till one day you will scare somebody to come in the night and have a look. So first time you may be wrong, second time you'll be correct. But you know, but that is the way it goes. Not to be scared at all. I would just tell an example out of it, sir. As uh, sir was saying in the night yesterday, Niranjan, my friend, was in duty. So there was one another doctor's uh, grand, I'm like mother was there, post CA patient. So the no one was there in the duty, and uh, I'm like they, he doesn't know the echo proper echoes and all. But we just uh, kept a probe. There was a large tamponade. Blindly we kept a needle, and the patient survived. If there was a fear or there was an inhibition, she would not have survived by the time cardiologist came. I think for the beginners, I think it's pretty important daily to try it and echo machine. Yeah, yeah today echo has been uh, has become the armamentarium of uh, intensivist and uh, just like monitoring uh, your vital parameters, today echo monitoring is very, very important in selected group of patients. I don't say all the patients, but there are high risk, uh, high risk group of patients where you know that the uh, heart functions are compromised or likely to compromise. I think we should use ultrasound as an important tool to assess the hemodynamics also and overall uh, progress of the patient can also be assessed with the help of today. So I think it should become a uh, gold standard as the clinical practice is concerned. So uh, with this, I think uh, we are uh, already overshooting with the time and uh, I would like to conclude the session and I must uh, thank uh, Dr. Vivek, a good friend of mine, for your elaborative and extensive uh, know, talk on this topic. I know you have done uh, great justice with this and I've got feedback. So thank you uh, very much for uh, your presence today and uh, deliberation. Uh, I would like to hear from you again and again. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Pradeep. Dr. Pradeep. Hello. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank Dr. Pradeep DeCosta as well uh, uh, for your uh, insights, sir. And uh, it's really uh, worth uh, knowing uh, the intricacies of uh, the 2D echocardiography and uh, ultrasound. Uh, and uh, I would also thank uh, Dr. Neeraj Thaggi uh, for the wonderful inputs on this topic, a very important topic. And I hope uh, the students must have realized how important uh, it is to 
you study echocardiography uh, in your day to day practice and i also thank uh, dr swarn uh, deepak uh, for your presence and uh, insights on the topic and i also thank uh, dr subhadeep sen uh, uh, and hope to hear from you all stalwarts again and again uh, this is evolving branch probably it has not come up in routine practice but very soon i expect that the echocardiography also become a routine practice like your monitoring vital parameters to the echo parameter monitoring also become uh, uh, very important and uh, with this uh, i like to conclude and i would like to hear from uh, all the panelists and speakers in uh, you know if, if you can give some advice to the students in a short uh, you know message like uh, you know if you can provide insights uh, would you so doctor? my just my one uh, take home message for all the fellowships and dnb students is that the bedside clinical examination cannot uh, it's it should be a complementary to the 2d echo uh, neither a contradictory because the 2d echo alone give you the values but it has to be correlated with the current clinical scenario when the patient is in the bedside so that that's why the bedside uh, examination is the more important and most vital this is my take home message Uh, Dr. Vivek, my just one, my take home message is I am available, and I think uh, whatever skill sets we have in India, very good. It's just that we have all come up from an informal pathway and not a formal training program. But then uh, I think there's a lot of talent available in India for all of you to pick up and become very good echo cardiographers. and you are getting good machines now like one of the recent ones which is ai enabled where you just have to put the probe and you know it will automatically capture all your lvot vti ef and other things so this is the future in us most intensivist internal medicine residents of course there's no phc pnt have their own machines and which are called pocket rockets which paul mayo told me and they uh, instead of going for one vacation in one term they save the money and they buy it so the thing is it's there for the future and this is the weapon which will brand us intensivists as separate from other specialties see somewhere in india you have to realize we are diluted we come below cardiologists nephrologists you know everything and all this is a specialty where today if you put the probe you can say ongoing gi bleed you can say rails tube not in place you can renal failure because the renal resistive index or the venous congestion in the kidney we and there are lot of us available like say even today i am learning now i am learning how to differentiate between large and small bowel loops and pick up you know uh, say peritoneal stripes and you know free intra peritoneal i'm trying to master it so there is a learning curve for everything and you know there is lot of talent we have all the resources you don't have to spend any money and all most centers in india the pcp entity is not a issue at all please go ahead and all of us are available you can connect with us any any time and uh, you know and uh, we were we are there to help you and guide you sure thank you thank you dr vivek dr pradeep i would say and it has been said many times that this is a stethoscope of the modern century yes. but uh, like a previous speaker and someone mentioned that this has to be has to be in addition to clinical examination robust clinical examination a robust evaluation of your lab and lab parameters and evaluations and if you add the sonography to this it will give you the best results oh wow. thank you very much dr neeraj uh, i'll say that uh, we are clinicians first and uh, ultrasound echocardiography should be used to answer a clinical question so as we do with any test there has to be a pre test probability what i am trying to look and does what i was expecting is there or it is something which is unexpected because as dr vivek pointed out there is plethora of information it gives and unfortunately we have seen if we do not know how to interpret that information ultrasound has a similar you know can say future situation which we face with pac that yeah there is so much of information but how to use it so use it in conjunction with what you are looking at try to find hard what you are looking at and if you don't find it please go back to the original clinical question really i mean wonderful insights yeah dr swarna deepak 
I have two things to say, sir. Uh, I'm like, it has been my pleasure to listen to all the seniors and I learned a lot and thank you for inviting me. Second thing is a simple thing, fake it till you make it. Try to keep on using it, using it every day and try to clear off your doubts. And as I think many of the seniors told us at maybe at the end of some time, you will become master and uh, you'll be second to none. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, but we should not forget our clinical tools. That is very important. We have seen residents uh, using ultrasound first and uh, avoiding clinical assessment. A number of occasions we have identified, but I think we should follow the right path. Let us follow clinical pathways first and then use these armamentariums when needed and use it judiciously. We don't completely rely on this parameter only. We should have a global assessment. A holistic approach is very, very important when you are trying to read the patient in terms of hemodynamics. So with this, uh, I think uh, the delegates must have uh, had a lot of learning from today's uh, webinar. And I hope to see you all the stalwarts and the uh, you know, seniors and my colleagues uh, again on the same platform. And uh, learning is a never uh, evolving. I mean, uh, it's a daily business. I think with this perspective, we'll keep learning and hope to see you again. Uh, today, I would like to conclude and say thanks to you all again and bye-bye for now. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you. Good night, guys. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.